the disappearance of two paperboys from the suburbs of Des Moines in the early 80s, ignited a new era of investigations of missing children cases from all across America. These two cases played a crucial role in establishing the nationwide missing children milk carton program in the 80s, which was eventually phased out. It was however, an important precursor to the more effective Amber Alert system, which helps law enforcement agencies and media outlets distribute news of child abductions more effectively and quickly. Join us as we explore these two tragic cases that paved the way for better investigative procedures for missing children reports. Johnny Gosh was a happy and responsible 12-year-old who took his paper delivery job seriously, but he also enjoyed his daily paper route working for the Des Moines Register. September 5, 1982 was a Sunday, and little Johnny was one of the two paper boys who departed before dawn to begin their paper route. Gosh usually was accompanied by his father on his daily deliveries, but on that particular day, his father did not wake up. Instead, he took their family dog, Gretchen along with him. A little after dawn, Johnny ran into a man driving a dark blue car, wearing a baseball cap. Other paper boys and a neighbor named Mike, recall having seen Gosh talking to this man. Nobody knew who this stranger was, but it was the last time anyone had seen Gosh. One of the other paper boys had even claimed that a strange man asked him for directions on the same day, but he could not be sure if it was the same man seen talking to Gosh. Witnesses disagreed on what happened next. Some insisted that a man followed Johnny around a street corner before snatching him. Others claimed they heard a car door slam before watching a vehicle careen out of their sight. When Johnny's parents John and Noreen started receiving phone calls from customers along their son's paper route, complaining of undelivered papers, John set out to search for their son by taking the same paper route. To his shock, their dog Gretchen returned home without Johnny, and John found the boy's wagon still full of newspapers two blocks from the family home. Around 8.30 a.m., the Gauches contacted the West Des Moines Police Department and reported Johnny's disappearance. Back in 1982, the protocol for investigating missing person cases required observing a mandatory waiting period of 24 to 72 hours before filing a missing persons report. This meant that the Gosks' complaint would not be looked into until the waiting period was observed. Although the police did come over later that day to the Gosks' house to take a report, they were skeptical about Johnny's disappearance as they had hinted that it might be a runaway case. Despite their initial stance on Johnny's disappearance that he might have been a runaway, they later changed their statement and suggested that Gosh was kidnapped based on multiple witness statements. But they did not have any physical evidence and no suspects to take the investigation forward. Noreen Gosh, however, was frustrated by the police department's lack of initiative, so she started making calls to her friends and acquaintances to organize a search party. Eventually, about 30 officers were summoned that afternoon to help friends and neighbors search for Johnny, but the police were reluctant to involve the FBI, telling the Gosts that they did not consider Johnny to be in danger. The case quickly went cold. A little less than two years after Johnny Gosh's disappearance, 13-year-old Eugene Martin shared a similar fate as that of Johnny on August 12, 1984, a Sunday. Eugene was preparing to deliver the Des Moines Register newspapers in the south side of Des Moines area. Eugene normally delivered the papers with his older stepbrother, but on this day he went alone. Eugene wanted to make some extra money so he could go pick out a new bicycle with his dad in a week, when he would have turned 14. Witnesses said they saw Martin talking to a clean-cut white male in his 30s sometime between 5 and 5.45 a.m. at Southwest 12th Street and Highview Drive. Witnesses claimed that the two appeared to be having a friendly conversation. When customers called to report not receiving their morning newspapers, the manager went out and found the bag outside of Des Moines. He delivered the papers himself before informing Eugene's parents about his disappearance. At approximately 8.40 a.m., the search for Eugene began. He has not been seen since. Eugene disappeared from the same vicinity where Johnny Gosh was last seen in 1982. And there seems to be a lot of similarities between the two cases. They were about a year apart in age at the time of their disappearances. They were both paperboys for the Des Moines Register and both vanished on an early Sunday morning around the same time of year. The disappearances occurred in quiet, suburban, 
low crime neighborhoods and there were no signs of a struggle at either scene. Despite these similarities, authorities have not been able to find any conclusive evidence to connect both the cases. The disappearances of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin were not the only cases that made news in the 80s, as there were a string of other missing paperboys in the Des Moines area that seemed to have taken place in a similar fashion. The following missing person cases have all occurred in the Des Moines area, but have never been officially linked to the missing of Gosh and Martin. On March 29, 1986, the day before Easter, 13-year-old Mark James Warren Allen, told his mother he planned to walk to a friend's house down the street and possibly watch a movie. He asked his mother to save some pizza for him to eat when he got home. He never arrived at his friend's home and has never been seen again. 15-year-old Jim Pollock, a carrier for the Des Moines Register, was out delivering papers on the morning of July 10, 1986 when he was grabbed by a man in a camouflage poncho. Jim managed to wrestle away from his assailant, then ran home and called the police. This occurred only half a mile from where Johnny's wagon was found abandoned over three years ago. Jim told police he had been chased six weeks prior in a separate incident, but it is unknown if it was the same man who chased him on July 10. At around 5 a.m. on November 1, 1988, 10-year-old Mike Fackler was delivering newspapers for the Des Moines Register, when a heavyset man wearing a white jogging suit jumped out of his car, and began to chase him. Mike ditched his bag and ran screaming to a neighbor's home, where the owner pulled Mike inside the house and called the police. Mike lived roughly two miles from Johnny's home and less than eight miles from Jean's. There were two other separate abduction attempts made on Des Moines Register carriers, who were both around 11 years old. A total of five failed abductions of paper carriers were reported in the Des Moines region between 1986 and 1989. Whether the perpetrators in these cases had any connection to Gosh and Martin's cases, is still unknown. One of the most peculiar statements made by Johnny Gosh's mother Noreen, was that she was once visited by her missing son in the early hours of a morning in March of 1997. She claimed that her son, who was then 27 years old, accompanied by another man whom she did not recognize, told her that he had been a victim of an underground pedophile ring, she claimed that Johnny told her that he was kicked out of this politically connected pedophile organization, now that he was too old, but that he still feared for his life and that he has to live under a new identity. He allegedly stayed for over an hour talking to Noreen, but would not divulge any information about where he was going, and he also told her that he would not be returning to visit again. Her husband John doubts the authenticity of Noreen's account of this chance encounter. In 1999, a witness in an embezzlement trial, claimed he had participated in Johnny's abduction and that he himself was a victim of the same child sex ring that got Johnny. When police investigated however, they discovered the witness had been in Omaha, Nebraska on the date Johnny disappeared. In August 2006, Noreen told the press that she had found some disturbing photographs left by the front door of her home. The images depicted three boys, one of them resembling Johnny, and all of them bound and gagged. In one of the pictures, the boy resembling Johnny was wearing sweatpants similar to the pair Johnny had worn when he was abducted. Other people connected to the case reported receiving copies of the photos, either through the internet or through anonymous deliveries. Noreen stated she believed the photos were of her son and were authentic, but the police think otherwise. A Florida law enforcement officer stated he had investigated the very same photographs in the 1970s before Johnny disappeared. He stated that he identified all the boys pictured, and they had willingly posed for the photos. Iowa police have yet to confirm the Florida investigator's account, but they stated they thought whoever gave the photographs to Noreen may have been playing a cruel prank. Even though Noreen Gosh's claims of an underground pedophile crime ring were never verified, Johnny Gosh's disappearance garnered a lot of national interest. Gosh's story was aired across the nation and covered the front pages of newspapers, disrupting the Des Moines suburb of a little over 22,000 at the time. A month after Johnny's disappearance in 1982, with no leads or suspects, Noreen and John formally launched the Johnny Gosh Foundation, to help fund private searches for Johnny and to share child safety information through their In Defense of Children program. In June of 1984, they and other parents of high-profile missing children helped establish the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That same year, 
The Gosks also authored and lobbied for the Johnny Gosh Bill at Iowa, which mandated immediate police response and involvement when a child was reported missing. Later adopted by eight additional states, it was signed into Iowa law on July 1, 1984. Both Eugene Martin's parents are now deceased, having believed that their son had died, but Noreen and John Gosh still believe that their son is still alive out there somewhere. And even though these two families had to go through such a tragedy, the missing cases of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin helped reshape the way missing children investigations are conducted today. What are your thoughts on Gosh and Martin's cases? Is it possible that they were both victims of a large underground pedophile crime ring? Or could it be that there was a child predator who committed these heinous crimes? Thank you for watching and we hope you found our video interesting. Like, comment and subscribe for more fascinating unsolved mysteries.